5.4, we're talking about equations and graphs of trigonometric functions, and that's on pages 266 to 281 in your text. Our curriculum outcomes is 30.3, demonstrate understanding of the graphs of primary trigonometric functions. Lesson objectives. Number one, to use the graphs of trigonometric functions to help solve problems. Number two, to be able to determine a trigonometric equation that models a problem. And number three, to use a trigonometric function for a real world situation. So we already know how to use the unit circle to answer questions like two cos squared x minus one equals zero. To do something like that, we would just isolate the cos x by moving the one to the other side. And then dividing them by two. And then taking the square root of both sides. So cos x equals plus or minus root one over two. Um, and that ends up being plus or minus root 2 over 2. So we know how to solve these equations from last unit, and that's just using the unit circle. So what we're going to do today, we need to solve trigonometric equations that looks like this, where your value that you get after you isolate for sine isn't going to be a number on your unit circle. So there's three options in how to do this. Number one, we could use graphing software to graph both sides of the equation to find out where the two of them intersect. So what I'm saying is if we're talking about this graph, we have a line which is y equals 10. That's this part of the equation right here. And then we could graph this sine function as well by using a program like GeoGebra. And it would look something like this, I'm sure. And then you can just find out your points of intersection. So that's one way of doing it. Our second option, we can manipulate the equation to solve for zero, graph it, and then find the x-intercepts. So in doing that, we would just be solving for, um, or sorry, moving everything to one side and plugging this new function into the GeoGebra pr program. So we just subtract 10 from both sides. And then you would get something that looks like this. And then your x-intercepts would be your answers. In both of these cases, these values would all be the same for x. And the third one, which we're actually going to do an example of, is solving this equation algebraically, and you wouldn't need to graph it at all. All right, so here's our example about solving a trigonometric equation algebraically, and we're going to find the general solution for the following trig equation, 10 equals 6 sine pi over 4x plus 8. So what we're going to try and do is we're going to try and isolate our sine of our angle, and our angle just happens to be pi over 4x. So to do that, we just manipulate this thing algebraically. We subtract 8 from both sides. We get a 2. And then we will divide both sides by 6. And we get sine pi over 4x on the left right, right hand side. And on the left, we get uh, 1 third. So right now, we're saying that sine of this angle is equal to a third. So this is a positive ratio. So we know that when we find second function sine of both sides, in using our cast rule, we know that since we have sine being a positive ratio, that it's either going to be in quadrant one or quadrant two, and that the answer we get is our reference angle. And that's really important to notice. If it happened to be negative, if for whatever reason this ratio was negative, we'd be looking for two angles in quadrants three and four. So when we take second function sine of both sides, we get de 0 decimal 3398 on the left hand side, and we get just plain old pi over 4x on the right hand side. So decimal 3398 is this angle right here. It just happens to be in radians, because I went second function sine in radians because of this pi over 4. But this angle here is also decimal three, 0 decimal 3398. So we need to find out what that angle is, and that angle would be pi minus our reference angle. And that is 2 decimal 8018. So we actually have two equations that we're going to solve here, one for the angle that's in the first quadrant and one for the angle that's in the second quadrant. So we can set up two different equations. And then to solve each of these equations, we do the same thing. We'd multiply by 4 and we divide by pi. So manipulating this thing, we get uh, 4 times 0 decimal 3398 divided by pi. And over here, we would get 4 times 2 decimal 8018. 
that's supposed to be a decimal, divided by pi. On the left hand side, we get an answer of 0 decimal 4326 equaling x. And on the right hand side here, we have 3 decimal 5674. Now, these are just values for x. These are not the angle, but if we plug both these values for x in here, the right hand side will end up equaling 10, just like the left hand side. So we found our two answers, 0 0.4327 and negative 3.5674, and both those answers, if we plug it in for x, would satisfy this equation. The right-hand side would equal the left-hand side, but it wants the general solution. So the last time we saw the general solution was when we were talking about moving around that unit circle, and that every time you move around that unit circle, you get the same place, you get some co-terminal angles, and so your general solution has to reflect that. Now, we when we're talking about the unit circle, we always added plus 2 pi n at the end. And the n was any integer. And the reason we did that was because the period of a sine or a cos graph was 2 pi. So it took one complete revolution until we get back to the same thing. But our function has changed. It's not a regular sine function. It's not a regular cosine function anymore. Um, there's a definitely a, a stretch here, a horizontal stretch. So what we need to find out is the new period length. Now, we know that this value here is a value for b, so we know that b is equal to pi over 4. And we know our period length is equal to 2 pi over b. So all we need to do is just take this value for b and plug it in here, and we can find our actual period length of this function. So if we do that, we get 2 pi over pi over 4. Remember that when you're dividing by a fraction, you can turn that into multiplying by the reciprocal. That means that instead of dividing by pi over four, we're now multiplying by four divided by pi. We can cancel out the pi's and we get a value of eight. So that means our general solution will be x equals 0 0.4327 plus not two pi n, but eight n where n is any integer. Because you could do one full rotation to the left or to the right, in the positive direction or in the negative direction. And the other answer is x equals negative 3.5674 plus 8n, where n e i again, so where n is any integer. All right, another example. It says the number of hours of daylight on the 21st of each month in Windsor, Ontario is given in the table below. So we've got the day, so the 21st of January, and then 21st of February is 52 days in, 21st of March is 80 days in, etc., etc., etc. So first it says draw a scatter plot for the number of hours of daylight, H, in Windsor on the day of the year, T. So instead of going through how to graph each point, I just used um, a spreadsheet in order to graph it, and it looks an awful lot like a sinusoidal curve. So B it says write the sinusoidal function that models the number of hours of daylight. Well, first you need to take a look at this thing and does it look closer to sine or does it look closer to cosine? So hopefully when you're looking at it, you remember that sine starts and goes up and then down. Cosine starts up at one, goes down and then back up. Now, negative sine this could also look like a negative sine graph if it were to start at zero and go down first. So the red graph is negative sine. Likewise, negative cosine would start at negative one and then go up first. So this looks like an awful lot like a negative cosine graph and it's that's important for you to recognize that. So now we know that our graph is going to look like something like this. We got y equals negative a cosine b x minus c plus d. So there's four different values that we can plug a number in for. We need to find those four values. So as always, I think the easiest thing is going to be your amplitude or maybe your vertical shift. But in any case, if we find the amplitude first, we need to know the distance from the middle to the top. Well, that's kind of tricky. But we do have all these numbers here. So we're, we graph this function using these numbers, so we need to use them 
to answer this question. So your amplitude is really going to be your highest number minus your lowest number and then divided by 2 and that should put you somewhere in the middle. Now we don't know exactly where that's going to be so we'll let the numbers tell us. So our highest number is 15.28. Our lowest number is 9.08. So 15.28 here, 9.08 over here. And if we divide that by 2, that'll tell us our amplitude. And that tells us an amplitude of 3.1. So we've been able to fill in this value for A. The next easiest thing I think is D to find. And D is how far your entire graph has moved up. So the middle of your graph is normally centered on the x-axis. So we need to find out how many units up it is. Well, we need to find out where the middle is then. We know that our maximum point is 15.28. And we know that the amplitude is 3.1. So the middle of the graph is going to be 3.1 below 15.28. So we can subtract uh, 3.1 from 15.28, and we get 12.18. So that means that whole graph has moved from here all the way up to 12.18. Okay, so we have found a value for A, which is negative 3.1. We found a value for D, which is 12.18. We need to find a value for B and C. So remember that B is always connected to your period length. Well. We know that the new period is going to be 2 pi over b. And we know what the period length is of this function because we're talking about the um, a full year. So after a full year, this thing will repeat itself. So our period length is actually 365 days. So now we can solve for b. So we get b equaling 2 pi divided by 365. So we just have to find this value of C. Now, C is how far the graph is shifted left or right. We know that the minimum point is at 9.08 right here. So that means if we were to trace this function backwards, we'd get another point at 9.08 somewhere over here. Now, this last day, 9.08, last month, this would be at December 31st. Not 31st, we're talking about the 21st of each month. So that's December 21st. So really this whole function has been shifted to the left because it repeats, so you could back it up for as many years as you want or you could move it forward as many years as you want. It's gonna be the same pattern of, of temperatures, not temperatures, sorry, hours of daylight. And so this is a minimum of 9.08. There's another 9.08 over here. And that would have been on 10 days in the previous year. So that means that we've moved it to the left 10 days. So our final answer is negative 3.1 cosine 2 pi over 365. X plus, because we're considering it a shift to the left, 10 plus 12.18. So there is our function that describes the number of hours of daylight on the 21st of each month in Windsor, Ontario. All right, one last question. It says, use your function to predict the number of hours of daylight on February 10th. Well, here's our function. I kind of covered it up, but it's negative 3.1 cosine of 2 pi over 365, h plus 10 plus 12.18. I changed the y to t because it asked us to do that. It says um, we we're supposed to have a t for the day and hours of daylight h. So we're going to use it to predict the hours of daylight on February 10th. Well, on February 10th, that is the 41st day of the year. So all we need to know, or do, sorry, is instead of uh, having an h in here, we can plug in a 41 and solve our equation. So I'm plugging this in. So instead of H, I have 41 plus 10. So that's now 51 plus 12.18. And in doing that, what I'm going to do is take 2 pi, multiply it by 51, divide it by 365. I'm going to have my calculator again. We need our calculator in radians. 
because we're talking about it in terms of pi. So 2 times 3.14 times 51 divided by 365. I'm going to get a number here. I'm going to take cosine of that number, multiply it by negative 3.1, and then I'm going to add 12.18. And when I do, I get 10.2. So that means on the 41st day of the year, there's gonna be 10.2 hours of daylight. Let's see if that makes sense. Well, on the 21st day, there's 9.62. The 52nd day, there's 10.87. So somewhere in between, on the 41st day, there would be 10.2 hours of daylight. So in summary, we can analyze the graph of trigonometric functions to find answers to real world situation. Um, that's what math is for, is making connections to the real world. You can you solve trig equations just like you would solve any other type of equation. Some things you want to keep in mind though, you want to make sure your calculator is in radians, that's a big thing. If your equation has radians in it, so once you see that pi symbol, you know you're talking about that angle is going to be in radians. And you need to make sure to solve the equation twice. That's really, really important. And based on the cast rule. I guess the one more thing is you need to find the new period length. Don't just assume it's going to be 2 pi like we used with the unit circle because it's not always the same because there has been some transformations to those trig equations. And creating a scatter plot can help you identify the characteristics of a sinusoidal function. So that means when I say characteristics, I mean the values for A, B, C, and D. Thus helping you build an equation that you could use to predict future events. So your assignment is on pages 275 and 281. This is, this is some tough stuff, but you need to give some questions a try in order to understand it. And I will uh, see you in class later.